Hi, I'm Sess, and I'm here to talk about the final battle theme of the final game of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, Almighty Brunevelsa from Lightning Returns. This beast of a soundtrack is, of course, 13 minutes long, and it's packed with themes from previous games. I don't know if it's a masterpiece or a fever dream, but it's certainly an experience. The way I see it, this soundtrack serves three purposes. It's a battle theme, it's an homage to the trilogy, and it's a story. These are the things I will be focusing on in this video. Since this is supposed to be about music, I will try to keep the lore and plot explanations to a minimum, so if you haven't played the game, you're probably going to be a little confused and you're going to get spoiled. You can't really do a spoiler-free analysis of Almighty Benevelsa, and to me that is one of its most interesting qualities. It really is a story. If you break it down and analyze the symbolism behind the themes in it, you're going to end up getting spoiled. One of those spoilers is that at its core, Bunuelsa is a rearrangement of Hope's theme. Yeah, the final boss theme of the trilogy that's often referred to as the Lightning Saga is not about lightning. It's about hope as time. It does make sense though, considering that a part of hope is literally inside Bunevelsa. So, before we head into Almighty Bunevelsa, we're taking a detour. To properly analyze this soundtrack, we have to talk about the Ark. The Ark is a rearrangement of Hope's theme from 13.2, which is a rearrangement of his original theme from the original game. I would have loved to break those down too, but I'm going to settle with showing you the main melody of his Lightning Returns theme, aka The Ark. That is the foundation of Almighty Bunevelsa. I know a lot of people don't read traditional western sheet music, and that is perfectly valid, but trust me on this. That is the foundation, the backbone of Almighty Bunevelsa, and I'm going to try to show it throughout this video. There are many variations of the arc in this soundtrack, so for my own sanity's sake, I decided to give them nicknames. We have the Battle Arc, the Chanting Arc, the Silent Arc, the Catchy Arc, the Harmonic Arc, and the Haunting Arc. And this isn't even a complete list. The melody shows up in other places too, but we'll get to that. Most of the versions in Almighty Bunevelsa have a 4 4 or an 8 8 time signature compared to the originals 3-4. I know that sounds like musicology nonsense, but it is the reason why the rhythm often sounds a bit off. The melody is there though. There is no escape from that melody. My sanity is not intact. Okay, back to the original version of the arc. Hope's trademark acoustic guitar is gone. But we have a choir that sings a melody that is very similar to his 13-2 theme. We also have this soft piano accompaniment that once made me refer to the soundtrack as godly hotel lobby music, which is accurate. Just like the arc itself, the soundtrack is light and relaxing. I mean, the religious undertones are impossible to miss, but it's very non-threatening and atmospheric. 
The same cannot be said about Almighty Bunvalsa. We're going to encounter a lot of interludes of wild organ, brass, choir combinations that I'm not even going to try to break down. It's chaos for the sake of chaos, and it fits the game as a whole, considering its plot. There are parts of Almighty Bunavelsa that reminds me of the legendary Dancing Mad from Final Fantasy VI. They are both unpredictable, they keep you on your toes, and sometimes they're just really uncomfortable to listen to. Yeah, I think that should be all. I think we should be ready to head into Almighty Bunavelsa now. Let's go! Starting strong with a chaotic organ. Yeah. We're heading towards our first DR. Remember, rhythm will be off, but the melody is there. Battle yeah, it's it's there. Not non-threatening and atmospheric anymore though. <laughs> no, this this is war. This is what I usually refer to as the I don't give a shit organ. The two beat melody that just keeps going. <laughs> I have no idea what the brass is doing. I am never transcribing this. Chanting arc. Square Enix never released the lyrics to this, so I have no idea what they're saying. But we're building. Time to pay attention. Did you catch it? That was our first cameo. The choir does try its best to drown it out with another version of the arc, but you can catch traces of Saber's edge there. You can hear it in the piano, the percussion and the five beat rhythm. So let's listen to the original. Percussion and piano. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's such a good battle theme. Symbolically, it could represent hope reaching out to lightning, trying to remind her of who they used to be. Or it's just a nice homage to the first game. Who knows? Now that we've heard the original, let's give Almighty Bonavelsa another go. Percussion. Piano. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. It's Saber's Edge. Now comes 
the most uncomfortable part of the entire soundtrack. The Silent Ark. Half a minute of near complete silence makes my skin crawl. Pay attention to the drums here. This is a stretch. I am very much aware that this is a stretch. So I knew that Nas and Requiem was supposed to be in here somewhere, but no one seemed to agree on where. So I listened and listened and listened and found drums. Vibes and drums. Let's listen to the original Nas and Requiem and Focus on the drums. It's such a stretch, but it's what I've got. The reference is so discreet that I wouldn't even have put it on the list if it hadn't been for the symbolic meaning behind the soundtrack. Nas and Requiem is the soundtrack that plays when you fight Orphan's final form in the original game. So, the final boss theme. Orphan is a paradoxical being that wants to be destroyed, believing that it will reawaken the Maker, Unwelza, but it can't free itself from its pre-programmed sense of self-preservation. Part of it wants to live, and part of it wants to die. Bunevelsa makes it abundantly clear in this fight that he wants to live, but there is a part of him that wants to die, and that part is called Hope as Time. Hope wants Lightning to kill Bunevelsa, even though it means that he would have to die himself. The context behind all of this is way too complicated to bring up in a video like this, but there are parallels. There are definitely parallels. The drums. The damn drums. They do serve as a really nice build-up though to one of my favorite parts of this soundtrack, so we're going to listen to them one more time. That was, of course, Caius's theme from 13-2. Different melody, different rhythm, but the chanting. If you've played that game, just hearing the words the Amortis should be enough to make you flinch. This cameo wasn't discreet at all, but let's listen to the original anyway, as a treat. Stop somewhere. I don't want to, but I have to stop. We're going to get another round of the Almighty Benevelsa version later, so 
I guess that's enough Kaiser theme for now. The references to Saber's Edge and Nascent Requiem had some pretty interesting symbolic implications, but Caius's theme? This is where it starts to get interesting on a story level. The lyrics most likely refer to the oath that Caius and his predecessors swore to Etro, the former goddess of death, rest in pieces. Since making Lightning the new goddess of death was Universe's original plan, it makes sense to add Kai's theme to this soundtrack. It also happens to be one of the best battle themes in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. I will die on that hill, so uh, excellent choice. Okay, so I know I said I was going to focus on the music and not the plot, but let's dig a little deeper. This part of the soundtrack does need some context. I think it's worth mentioning here that in the Japanese version of the game, Benevelsa's battle quotes during the first three stages of the fight were a little bit more suggestive than the English ones. Here are some examples brought to us by Tensai Shuyu, a translator who has done some major heavy lifting for this fandom. Yeah, let's just say that Bonavelsa was interested in lightning on more than just a professional level. So, here's where things get interesting. Gods don't have feelings in this universe. They don't even understand the concept of it. Bonavelsa's attempt to control hope ultimately failed because he didn't realize that you can't sever the bond between memories and emotions. This is foreshadowed over and over in the game, and on a second playthrough, the parallels are painfully obvious. I also want to add that in these games, gods are not supposed to be able to talk. We've seen Etro and Pulse try to communicate with humans, but they mostly bombard their unfortunate conversation partners with barely comprehensible images. Bunevelsa, on the other hand, is talking and expressing emotions. Anger, fear, and whatever that is. <laughs> if we combine that context with the inclusion of Caius's theme, we have some pretty solid proof that this god has been severely affected by a human. Not a king shame, but hope. What the fuck? Anyway. At this point in the battle, Bonavelsa is beyond done with Lightning's refusal to accept his job offer. He is very much trying to kill her, but the music kinda contradicts that. I'm not sure if Lightning is supposed to be the goddess or the most dear one in this scenario, but it doesn't really matter. I'd say that the contradiction between Bonavelsa's actions and the lyrics playing in the background speaks for itself. I'm going to leave it at that to avoid awakening discourse and drama from 2013. But conclusions can certainly be drawn. Let's continue. I'm going to backtrack a little because there's something going on with the organ. There's something arkish about it. I'm not adding it to the list, but there's something arkish going on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's go. We're delving up to the catchy art. This one has some extra notes in the melody, but it is the art. I don't know, there's something about the beat. Mm -hmm. 
we just slipped into the harmonic part. The male and female choir just complement each other beautifully. And the brass. It's a little tricky to hear, but the brass is actually following the melody with a slight delay. It's like a brass echo, and it gives the rhythm a really nice fluid vibe. Back to the chanting art, but that brass, it's still a key thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was a pretty abrupt stop, but I don't want to spoil what comes next. This is something I would never have caught myself, but thankfully there are people out there with sharper ears for lyrics than me. Apparently, during those last five seconds, the choir was chanting lyrics from Ragnarok, from the original game. I'm not going to show the unofficial English translation to this, because even I, who don't speak Latin, can see how inaccurate it is. What I do know is that it's a lot of embrace your fate, destroy the world, awaken the divine going on. The usual. So, let's check the original. It does take the soundtrack a little while to get to where it's relevant to us, so I'm going to skip to Persomnum. Yeah, they changed pretty much everything but the lyrics, and that's not entirely accurate either, but we'll get there. It's a bit of a stretch, but Ragnarök is the end of the world in Norse mythology, and Bunevelsa has been trying pretty hard to convince Lightning to embrace her and humanity's fate, so I suppose it fits. There's this detail that I find really interesting, though. The lyrics have been specifically altered for Almighty Bunuelsa. If they just wanted a nice cameo, they could have chosen anything from that. But no, they decided to change the lyrics. To me, that's another sign that this soundtrack is supposed to be a story. Like I said before, I don't speak Latin, so I had to ask around a little for help. This is what we ended up with. This is what they were chanting during those last five seconds. The grammar is questionable, but Bunavelsa is a divine deity and he did sleep for quite some time and his messenger is probably pretty damn miserable. Alright, let's throw ourselves straight into the next cameo. And I mean straight into it. Short, but efficient. I don't know about you guys, but I get this instantaneous fight or flight response every time I hear that offbeat brass choir combination. As most of you probably already know, 
This soundtrack is called Fighting Fate, and it plays every time you have to fight Barthandalus in the original game. Here's the original version. Yeah, they didn't really change much at all. <laughs> they just added more brass, threw it straight into Almighty Bunuelsa and called it a day. I love it. <laughs> Fighting Fate is another excellent addition to this soundtrack. It has the same lyrics and core melody as Ragnarok, but the delivery is completely different. We are not supposed to buy into this. We're supposed to fight it. I think it's interesting that this soundtrack comes straight after the Ragnarok chanting. Bunuvelsa doesn't want Lightning to fight fate, but hope does. This god is dealing with some serious internal dissonance. And on we go. Slipping straight into the haunting arc. I really love the way the choir, organ, and strings are just playing off each other. Beautiful call and response. And this is why we can't have nice things. I mean, we're back in the beginning. That sure sounded like a loop, but it's not a loop. Things are going to get... Yeah, we're going to have repetitions, but there are going to be differences. The battle arc is back. This is the ninth time we hear this late motif. It really is the backbone of the soundtrack. Yeah, the I don't give a shit organ is back. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on here. I don't think I'm supposed to either. Chaos for the sake of chaos. Just embrace it. <laughs> oh, we're building. Chanting art. Sure would have been nice to know what they're chanting, but... And this is where we should have had Saber's Edge. But there is no piano. Just the church bells and choir. If there is a crucial goal going on between Hope and Bunuelsa, Bunuelsa has the upper hand here. Hope is not coming through. And oh god, here we go. <laughs> Silent Ark. There's this mechanical noise going on in the background that it unsettles me. But 
but here comes the nascent requiem drums. And we know what that means. The Amortis time! Someone is calling out to the goddess of death or the most dear one. Fighting fate again. If you thought for feminist theme to need to get more chaotic, think again. We should actually have had the harmonic card here if it had been a move, but I guess we're past that. <laughs> We're just playing every chaotic interlude at once. This is fine. And we're fighting fate one final time. <laughs> You can't end a 13 minute soundtrack with this and not call it a dancing mad homage. Another hill I will die on. And that was the real loop. We reach the end. That was Almighty Bunuelsa. I broke it down. It broke me down. How are you guys doing? <laughs> so, I guess it's conclusion time. In the introduction, I told you guys that this soundtrack serves three different purposes. It's a battle theme, it's an homage to the trilogy, and it's a story. Battle theme? Check. Homage? Check. So, what about the story? My main takeaway from this wild combination of soundtracks is that Hope S Time is fighting a capital G god from the inside. Saber's Edge can be interpreted as Hope reaching out to Lightning, trying to remind her of who they used to be before they got swept up in this literally divine nightmare. And the lack of Saber's Edge in the loop that's not a loop would indicate that his voice doesn't always come through. Nascent Requiem points out Benevelsa's paradoxical nature and that Hope is willing to die to save Lightning and humanity. Caius's theme puts even more emphasis on the dissonance going on within Benevelsa. And it can be interpreted, please don't kill me, as an expression of Hope's feelings. The immediate transition between Ragnarok and Fighting Fate is another sign that there's a push and pull going on between Benevelsa and Hope. In this case, it's about 
embracing fate versus fighting fate. Since the lyrics to Ragnarok were specifically altered for Almighty Bunevelsa, I do believe that this juxtaposition was deliberate. And then we have the most important component of this soundtrack. The Ark. The Ark did, in a way, represent the clash between Bunevelsa and Hope all along. In the actual Ark, it was Bunevelsa who was using Hope as his eyes and ears, trying to influence him by repressing his emotions. But in the Cosmogenesis, where the final battle takes place, the roles have been reversed. Gods in this universe are not supposed to have feelings, but Bunevelsa does. Hope is now the one influencing him, and the dissonance can be heard loud and clear in Almighty Bunevelsa. Final conclusion? Lightning Returns was always about hope. Thank you for watching this monstrosity of a breakdown video. If you're still here, you're a trooper. <laughs> I'm new to this, but I think that this is where I'm supposed to say press the like button, subscribe, leave a comment down below, but do whatever. I'm just happy you're here. <laughs> Seriously though, if I missed something or you have a different interpretation of this soundtrack, please tell me. I would love to hear your thoughts. With that said, I think I'm done. Bye!